rejoice again for another day. And um, uh, the most part of this day, you've given us an evening service. We rejoice that we get to gather together again around your word and worship you. And we pray that you would bless tonight. Bless your word. Bless our singing, our giving, our fellowship, uh, the things that we say. Help us to be a blessing to one another, to minister to one another. And we thank you for those that are watching online. We pray, Father, that you would use the word in, in their lives. We want to glorify you. And Father, we want to be a, a genuine lighthouse in Upper Darby, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. And we pray that you would help us, uh, if you tarry, that you would give us time to, to just be that lighthouse. And we pray for a revival, Father. It's been a topic on many minds. And uh, we pray, we beg you for revival, genuine revival. Uh, if what is happening is, is uh, even partly of you, we pray that it would be wholly of you. And uh, Lord, we ask you to do a great work and use us. May we be a part of that, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Please remain standing. All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll open up to hymn 413, Take Time to Be Holy, hymn 413. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in is blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see take time to be holy let him be thy guide and run not before him whatever be tied Enjoy our in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Amen. You may be seated. All right, uh, just a couple of announcements uh, tonight. Uh, Sunday, April 30th, the uh, fifth Sunday of April, we'll have a uh, soup and chili fellowship after the morning service. That means uh, anybody who wants to bring soup or chili in, and uh, uh, we'll enjoy a little bit of fellowship, and then uh, followed by a panel discussion. If there's any particular topic you want to discuss, let Pastor know. Also, there's a new uh, letter from Josh uh, about his mi summer missions trip on the back table, I, and uh, if uh, Get it. It's an updated uh, letter, so uh, uh, get it and uh, read it and prayerfully consider it. This time, I have the ushers come forward as we take our general offering. Gore, could you say a perfect offering, please? Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you, Father, for salvation that you freely given us. Mm -hmm. We pray that you help us to do work. That's the portion of what we gave back to you. For your sake. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
I, yeah, I had heard this coming in today. Uh, Gore just uh, brought it to my attention. Uh, if you don't have a cell phone, uh, there's an emergency alert if you live in Philadelphia uh, about the drinking water. Apparently there was some type of spill in the Delaware River today. Uh, the last uh, message uh, I got is uh, based on latest sampling uh, results data. The Philadelphia water is now confident is now confident tap water from Baxter drinking water plant will remain safe to drink and use at least through min, uh, midnight on Monday. So, uh, Phil, if you live in the city and uh, you get your water from there, I mean, Delaware County is uh, Springton Lake. I'm not sure how far they come in. Uh, just something to be aware of. We talk about putting your faith in men. How many times do you really think about, where's the water come that I drink? You turn the tap on, you drink it. But we have a lot of faith, don't we, in so many other things except for God. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. Thank you for being here tonight. It is a blessing to have you here. What a blessing. Uh, if you've not been part of our morning services, we've been having really good turnouts and encouraging uh, spirit. A lot of folks, we'd love to have you back, all you that are sitting at home in your jammies. I know the, the, the slippers are so comfortable. We might even let you wear slippers if you'd come to church at night. I don't know, you know. We want you here. We want you here to be with us. All right, Jeremiah chapter 2. Let's get there. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to, as you know, the last uh, part of Jeremiah chapter 2, there's two sections. And uh, it starts in verse 29. So we've already looked at the first section. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at verses 34 through 37. That's the second section. Uh, they were written, the first one was written into the uh, plural, second one singular, so they're, they're definitely distinct. But to get the whole context, we're going to begin reading in verse 29. So Jeremiah chapter 2, I'll read verses 29 to the end, and then we'll remain standing for prayer. God says to the people of Judah, Wherefore will ye plead with me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore say my people, we are lords. We will come no more unto thee. Can a maid forget her ornaments? Or a bride, her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn away or turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt, as thou wast ashamed of Assyria. Yea, thou shalt go forth from him, and thy hands upon thine head. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidences. And thou shalt not prosper in them. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer. Our God in heaven, we come before you mindful of our need to be fed the heavenly manna of your word. And we pray today that, that you would feed us. And Father, that you would help me and guide my lips. Uh, as, as I have studied this text, I pray the spirit of God would, would now illuminate the minds as, as I proclaim it. And help me to be consistent with the scriptures, what it says. And then, Father, help us to understand how we can benefit and what this means to us in our relationship with you today. Father, thank you for your love for Israel. Thank you for your love for a people that so many times did not appreciate or understand the covenant relationship they had with you. And Father, thank you so much for the relationship that you've given to us as the bride of Christ. And I pray that we would cherish 
that precious relationship, that it would be uh, an abomination for us to ever think of walking away from you. And Lord, I ask your blessing on the word tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll open up to hymn 476. I surrender all. Hymn 476. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, may Savior, holy thine, let me feel thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee. My blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight again. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. We are going verse by verse through the book of Jeremiah. And we're at message number 18. And we're still just in chapter 2. So we got a long way to go. And I I hope this is not a drudgery. God's Word should never be a drudgery. drudgery. Uh, There's so much in here for us. And the theme of Jeremiah, as, as, as we've laid it out so much, uh, it is a message to uh, the, northern, the, the, the southern northern kingdom had already split, so we're not in the United Kingdom, which was limited to the time of Saul, and then David, and then Solomon, and then the kingdom split, uh, two tribes one way, uh, the rest the other. Uh, and so Israel, which was the northern tribes, two tribes, uh, has already been um, done in. Assyria came and, and, uh, and God sent his judgment and they were brought into captivity into Assyria. 
And now God is trying to reach Judah, the remaining tribes, to get them to repent. Uh, they're in the promised land now for many years. They have been enticed by the false religions of the Canaanites, worshiping uh, Baal and Moloch and Ashtaroth and others, and uh, really being enamored by their false gods. And God is sending Jeremiah as their last ditch effort. He's already sent other prophets. They would not heed them. And so now, now Jeremiah is their last chance. Now because we are post facto, uh, we're on the other side. We already know what happens. Uh, and they didn't heed. They didn't listen to Jeremiah. They didn't listen to any of the prophets. And so God judged them just like he said. And he allowed King Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Babylonians to come and bring them into captivity. Uh, but we are now on the, you know, we're on the previous side of this. And God is appealing to them because he entered into a covenant with them. And they entered into a covenant with God uh, at the base of Mount Sinai upon getting the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and they had an obligation to walk with God. They had a, an obligation to cultivate a relationship with Him. Uh, they were in a, a very special covenant relationship. And uh, so God uses this picture, this human uh, relationship, likens their uh, defection from Him as unfaithfulness, as, you know, as not just adultery, but harlotry, uh, because they are... Uh, forsaking the living true God and following the false gods of the Canaanites. And so we see this theme throughout. And of course, this is what we've been hitting on. And it reminds me of uh, maybe something that you can't relate to, but I remember being in high school, uh, you know, being brought up not with any uh, real parameters on, on relationships and dating. And, uh, you know, any girl I was attracted to, I fell in love with immediately and tried to court them and get them to marry me, even though I was just a freshman. Uh, but I remember many times, uh, you know, in, in quote-unquote dating, I remember, um, you know, th there would be initial interest, we'd start a relationship, and then I heard this a few times, and maybe some of you heard this. Let's just be friends. Can we just be friends? You know, that, there's so much to that. Uh, you know, that's, in other words, you know, let's back off. And it's probably a good thing they did that. But on my end, it, you know, you, you look at someone and you have a feelings for them and, and uh, they're not reciprocating those feelings. That's exactly what was happening with Israel. It was like Israel was saying to God, and I've, I've wrestled with the title for tonight because it's very similar to what we've been dealing with all here in chapters 1 and 2. And, um, you know, uh, I, I had all these different things I was going to throw around, but... The title is Let's Just Be Friends because that's what Israel was saying to God. And, and God, uh, they had already entered into a covenant relationship. They made a commitment. And, and now they're, they're just wanting... Uh, another title I was going to say was The Cold Shoulder because Israel is giving God the cold shoulder. Um, but I want you to... What we're looking at is God's response. And, and His response tonight, verses 33 through 37 is still following along what we dealt with last time, he is just, he's amazed at this rejection of this covenant relationship. that They do not value what they had in God. And so, we're going to see three things tonight. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at their affection. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 33. Uh, and, and by the way, there's, there's New Testament parallels to all this. Just as God was seeking to reestablish a relationship with the, the people of Judah, the Jews, so in the New Testament, even more so, you and I have a special covenant relationship in our walk with God through Jesus Christ. And so, in my mind, when I look at verse 33, and we look at their affection, I'm reminded of Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Set your affections, if ye then be risen with Christ, it starts out. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, not on the earth. Set your affections on things above, is the challenge. 
And that's what God is telling Israel. Then we go to 34 and 35. Chapter 2, 34 and 35 is their disregard. Their disregard for the very one that loved them. And then thirdly, we see the competition, which is twofold. Verse 36 and 37. Uh, first of all, this was, and this would be Israel's history, uh, they were looking, they viewed political alliances as being their, their savior or their refuge from the political threats. The nations around them that were a danger, which would have been and was Assyria, now it's becoming Babylon, uh, they viewed them as the problem like, you know, that's, if, if this nation comes and conquers us, they're the enemy, they're the problem. And so they were putting all their hope in, now they were looking to Assyria to help protect them from Babylon and even Egypt. But most importantly, it was a reflection of the fact that they were not seeking God. And they were going after the idols of the Canaanites. And God is, has some things to say about the uselessness of seeking these false gods. So let's just jump right in. Again, Jeremiah chapter 2. And verse 33, interesting statement, Jeremiah says, uh, God says through Jeremiah, Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? This is where, uh, there's an old English word here that, that may throw you off. The word trimmest has changed in meaning even since 1611, 1605, 1604 when the King James translators started translating. Uh, and, and so you might miss the meeting. Why trimmest thou thy way to love? In fact, let me back up and go even further than the King James. And uh, let's look at the, the Coverdale Bible, which was the follow-up from the Tyndale Bible. Uh, he translated it, Why boostest thou thy ways? And then the Bishop's Bible, which was the template for the King James Bible, says translates this phrase this way. Why beautifiest thou thy ways so highly? And the idea of trimmest thou, uh, it's, it's a term, uh, trimming, which means to, to set properly. Uh, it used to have the idea of dressing beautifully. And, and so what, what Jeremiah is saying, what God is saying, um, you ever heard the phrase, if a woman is, is going out for the night, someone might say, oh, she's getting all dolled up. And that's the idea of what he's saying. God is looking at Israel and they are, they're getting all dialed, dialed up. They're trimming, they're, you know, putting themselves together. They're, they're, and again, this is a picture. Just as someone would seek to court someone and, and, um, or be attractive to someone, Israel is going to lengths to show affection, and they have affection for the gods of the Canaanites. And so when he says, Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore thou hast also taught the wicked ones thy ways. In other words, they were so intent on pursuing. And these are all terminologies, are all phrases that speak of sexual immorality. Harlotry, prostitution, uh, and it's something that you'll see the word love, lover, harlot frequently mentioned. And, uh, and this is how God interpreted they're going after the false gods, the Canaanite cult. In fact, one, one theologian wrote this. He said, um, regarding that, he said, attention is now directed to Israel's tendencies to harlotry. She had set her course to seek love, presumably the fertility gods, small g, and their immoral rights. The use of sexually loaded terms like love, lover, harlot, frequent, frequent in the prophets. And he says, it is not always clear whether Israel became involved in physical sexual activity, but si since this formed part of the Canaanite cult, the reference may well have been both to the act of deserting Yahweh and to physical participation in cult activities. Jeremiah asserts that the people have, quote-unquote, set their course, uh, is the idea of why trimmest thou, uh, to seek lovers. They carefully planned uh, to accomplish their evil purposes. And then they had schooled others. So the idea was that, that Israel just went headlong involved in their immorality, and now they were teaching other women and, and really everyone in their camp 
uh, about this, this, this great violation which Yahweh, Almighty God, took as a personal affront. This was, this was a repudiation of everything. And again, the idea of wilt thou, or um, why trimmest thou thy way to seek love. It reminds me, going on with the theme of, of all these verses that we've already looked at, uh, you remember that, that Jeremiah used the phrase, uh, which may have been a play on words from the word Baal, vanity. And when God talked about you forsook me and you went after things that were worthless. And it reminds me, in this verse specifically, of Proverbs 23 and verse 5. The writer of Proverbs says this, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? Now in that context, he's talking about when you and I focus on money. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly as away as they fly away as an eagle, eagle toward heaven. Can you relate to that? You ever notice how um, riches, money, tends to fly away like an eagle towards heaven? You know, you you have it and then it's gone. And and so the the proverb, the writer of Proverbs says, Why why set thine eyes upon that which is not? And that's another way of just saying, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. In other words, you know, the things of this earth are going to quickly be gone. And now, this is even more so. Because Judah was setting their eyes upon that which was not, which was even more, the, it was more than just following earthly treasure and materialism. This was forsaking Jehovah God, Yahweh, for false idols that didn't even exist. And they had put their hopes and their loves and their affections in these idols. Before we get too harsh on Israel, you know, it is very easy for us to allow idols to creep into our lives. In fact, in Colossians 3, I quoted that earlier, later in that verse, it says, put off, uh, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then Paul begins to tell you about some of the things that we need to put off and one of them, he says, is covetousness, which is idolatry. Idolatry is a theme even in the New Testament. Now, we don't, I don't believe. Now, maybe some of you have a statue of Buddha in your house. I'd be surprised. Or, you know, um, some. definitely I doubt any of you have a carved image of, of Baal or Ashtaroth or Moloch, the gods that the, you know, the, the Canaanites worshipped. And so we look at them kind of like on our high horse and say, how stupid could these people be that they're worshiping these idols? But you know, we've, we've got a whole bunch of idols in America, in the land of plenty. We have plenty of things to distract us from God. And it is a daily challenge for us to, to allow God to take first place in our lives. And you know, it's interesting to me, I have learned, even, even as a pastor, you know, well, pastors, isn't that automatic spiritually? You automatically walk with the Lord because you're doing all this religious stuff? I wish, <laughs> I wish. Uh, but you know what? Every day I find there's things that distract me, even in the name of ministry, that can cause my focus to turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ and the ones I love. In fact, it is through relationship that I often learn about my relationship with the Lord. For a pastor, one of the best, clearest ways to know whether you're allowing the ministry to become an idol is how you treat your family. And I came across this example that I wish I could say I cannot relate to this. Just don't talk to Mary after, and maybe I could say that. But uh, this one pastor tells a story of, uh, he says, this was years ago, he said, I found myself with too many commitments and too few days. He said, I got nervous and tense about it. I was snapping at my wife and our children, choking down my food at mealtimes, and feeling irritated at those unexpected interruptions throughout the day. See, there's all kinds of things that can take you away from the Lord. He says it was becoming unbearable. 
Before, oh, he said, before long, things around our home started to reflect the patter of my hurry-up style. Men, you and I often set the tone in our homes. Keep that in mind. And uh, he says, I distinctly remember after supper one evening the words of our younger daughter. And she wanted to tell me something important that happened to her at school that day. And so she began hurriedly, Daddy, I want to tell you something, and I'll tell you really fast. Suddenly, realizing her frustration, this noble pastor answered, Honey, 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 honey. You can tell me, and you don't have to tell me really fast. What a loving dad. She said, he said, you can tell me slowly. And then he said, her response cut me deep. So again, he says, you don't, you don't have to hurry. You can tell me slowly. And she looked at him and said, okay, daddy, then will you listen slowly? <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. You know, and that, that was something the Lord used to, to get him to realize, whoa, you are just, you don't have your priorities right. The man's in ministry. The man's serving, doing things for Jesus. He's busy for Jesus. Folks, you and I can be busy. In fact, Israel was busy for, they were busy in religion. In fact, they were even going through all their sacrifices and doing the daily things, the priests and all the things that they did. They were still going through the motions. Oh, but their relationship with God was, was long, long severed. They were far, far from God. Look at verse 34. Jeremiah 2.34. Also, in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. This is not a new theme. This is something we've already looked at that he's brought up. In fact, we looked at 2 Kings 24, verses 1 and following. Uh, as one example, we also looked at uh, Manasseh, but uh, today I want to read, could go ahead, you don't need to turn there, but I want to read to you, because um, Jeremiah, this is going to become a theme about this, they're shedding blood, Israel shedding blood. Some people think that it might simply be referring to, and this was going on, because Israel was not putting God first, their justice system was all out of whack. They were not <coughs> properly, there were people that were innocent, the, the, the innocent people were, you know, justice was not prevailing because God was not on the throne. So they were not judging righteous judgments. And so because of that, uh, there were a lot of innocent people that were taken advantage of and, and uh, some of them had been slain and, and it could clearly be a reference to that. But there was so much injustice, so much bloodshed. There were the, just in their religious worship, as they worship Moloch. There's a phrase we'll hear that's in, other, in, in the Old Testament quite a lot. Where Israel horrifically allowed their children to pass through the fire of Moloch. And what that means literally is, this was part of the Canaanite worship of, Mo, of Moloch is they would have child sacrifice. And, and as hard as it is for us to imagine, professing believers in Yahweh and Jehovah God uh, participated in that. And then there's also, there's so many examples. You may remember King Ahab. Uh, remember that vineyard that he wanted? And he wanted it really bad. And Naboth wouldn't sell it. And his conniving wife very lovingly Serving her husband had Naboth killed when he wouldn't sell. Uh, and then there's this. I want you to listen to Jeremiah 26.20. We'll get to this down the road. But he shares another, just another example. And there are probably many others that aren't even listed. But in Jeremiah 26.20, it says, There was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemei of kerjath who prophesied against this city, and against this land, according to all the words of Jeremiah. So this was someone that was backing up Jeremiah's message. And when Jehoiakim, the king, and all his mighty men, and all the princes heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Urijah heard it, he was afraid and fled, and went into Egypt. 
And Jehoiakim the king sent men into Egypt, mainly El Nathan, the son of Akbor, and certain men with him into Egypt. And they fetched forth Uriah out of Egypt and brought him unto, king, uh, unto Jehoiakim the king, who slew him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. That's what they thought of Jeremiah's message. That, that some, a, a prophet that came and preached the same thing. Uh, they killed him. Uh, who knows why they did not do the same thing with Jeremiah. They certainly showed the same disrespect and contempt for what Jeremiah preached. Uh, maybe it was much like Ezekiel, who was earlier on, but Ezekiel, the challenge there uh, was that, uh, and I love this passage, we'll probably look at it down the road because they're parallel. The people of Israel uh, came, they loved to hear Ezekiel preach. They said, come and hear what are the words of the Lord. And they come as my people come. And they love thy sayings. They love to hear the preacher. But they will not do them. And so they love to hear Ezekiel preach. You know, he's apparently very popular. But nobody. But, but what he said meant nothing. Maybe Jeremiah was like that. Clearly his message was rejected. And now... And he says, I have not found it out by secret search, and this, uh, but upon all of these, this is probably one of the very difficult passages uh, to translate. King James translators talked about uh, some of the more difficult passages. That's why they put marginal notes, which if you have a King James Bible, most likely uh, it does not have the original marginal notes. Uh, they are very, very beneficial. And they put a marginal note next to this one phrase uh, because the Hebrew is... Uh, you know, there's some that say that, that he's talking about, um, that, 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 in other words, if you look at the next verse, yet thou sayest, because I am innocent. So there's some that would interpret this phrase, of, I have not found it by a secret search, but upon all these, the he, in, the, in the King James Version, the marginal, it says Hebrew digging. And there's some that believe the idea is, is speaking about uh, already going ahead into tr defending their innocence of slaying blood. And it goes, they go to uh, Exodus 22, where God allowed, in a situation, if somebody broke into your house as a Jewish person, and you, you were defending your home, and the, the, whoever, the intruder died, their blood was not on your hands. And some think it's a reference to that. Some think it's simply what, what it seems to say here, whether it, it is, as the translators put in their digging or secret search, is that this was not something that the Lord had to look high and low to, you know, oh, I saw in this corner, you know, you did, you shed some blood here. No, this is, this, it, it's so evident that they were guilty of shedding blood. There's so many instances that you don't even need to spend a lot of time looking. And now we move into chapter, verse 35. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent. And by the way, do you remember, there's a theme in Jeremiah already. We call, you remember, remember me using this Hebrew word rib, rib pattern? Uh, it is a legal term. I want to remind you this. You're going to be reminded again because this, this phrase is all, just emanates that. That uh, there was a charge, just like the first verse we read in our scripture reading tonight, uh, is that, that you know, they were bringing a legal charge against God and God was, in a sense, saying, oh, no, 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 you don't. And he was bringing a legal charge against them. And this is, this is the same idea, verse 35. In other words, you remember, I've, I used to preach, or I have preached before. Uh, remember me talking about gaslighting? You know, it's a big popular phrase these days. Uh, it, it's, it is a newer term, but it's something that is very common in human nature, where you gaslight, in other words, somebody, um, somebody makes you th start to question your sanity or your take on a specific situation, basically through lies. And, and we looked at Malachi, which is a great example of they were trying to gaslight God, because you know God would say, I'm charging you with this, and then they would say, what? How have we done this? And all throughout the book of Malachi, uh, they were trying to gaslight God. They were trying to, which is ridiculous if you think about it, you know. Clearly, they were the ones that were at fault. But when God tried to charge, God tried to say, here's where you're wrong. They're like, what? What are you talking about? And that's, that's what's going on here. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. And now God is saying, behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. And again, this is 
steeped in legal jargon to, to, to give us the idea that they were laying a charge against God and yet he was turning it back on them and say, saying, oh no, I am actually lab I'm lodging a formal protest against you because you've sinned against me. They didn't see it. They didn't see it. I am innocent. Surely his anger shall turn from me. Many believe, in fact, in, um, in 2 Kings 23, you don't need to turn there, 623 B.C., King Josiah, uh, and, and again, we read about it in 2 Kings 23, King Josiah had instituted some reforms. You may hear them referred to the revival under King Josiah, where he got rid of the, he literally cleansed house. And he tore down the idols, tore down the false, you know, all the pagan worships, the, the altars to, to, um, to Baal, and, and he just destroyed them all. And there was a, a time of reform. Sadly, it was short-lived. And many believe that this phrase in verse 35, surely his anger shall turn from me, was perhaps because of those reforms that it did not go far enough but obviously was enough to appease their conscience. You know, very much like if, you, if you're a Christian and you're struggling with your walk with the Lord, when you, you know, the Bible says a just man falls seven times and riseth up again. But when you're continually being defeated, you know, to whom a man is overcome, you, you think of all the proverbs, or excuse me, in Romans, um, that whatever overcomes us, we become its servant. And when, when, you, when you quit on God or you fall so many times, and any little effort you make to you, to me, is, especially if we've got failure in our past, let's, let's just hypothetically say you're in the habit of forsaking the Lord five days out of six, and then you go two weeks walking with the Lord, you're going to feel pretty spiritual. Like, man, I am on fire. I'm experiencing a revival. And, you know, the idea may have been that that was, it was kind of like Israel. You know, surely his anger has turned from me. Remember those reforms under Josiah? I want to remind you again. Even when they were doing the reforms, they were so short-lived because their heart wasn't where it needed to be. And even when they were going through the motions of religious worship and offering the sacrifices... God, God was, he said, I, I cannot away with, if you remember, we looked at that. And so, here again, is, is the challenge. And I, I want to remind you that, um, reminds me in Proverbs, there's a picture of the, the, the immoral woman who commits adultery, and, and the way uh, in the scriptures, especially in Proverbs, it talks about partaking of physical relationships, sometimes it even uses this idea of um, eating or drinking, referring to a husband and a wife together. Drink waters out of thine own cistern is a beautiful picture, challenging a husband and a wife to enjoy conjugal relationships. Um, and, and in fact, God uses that, that idea of drinking water out of your own cisterns. And, and then there's another phrase in Proverbs that says, uh, stolen waters are sweet. Bread eaten in secret is delightful. I forget the exact wording. But again, this idea of partaking. And um, you remember in, it was a chapter 1 or chapter, it might be earlier on in this chapter, uh, God charges Judah with two things. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, which can hold no water. That's again a reference to this. They weren't, they weren't delighting in the Lord. They weren't drinking from the fountain, uh, the, the spiritual water. And so to tie all that in, because it's still hanging around there, the verse that I was trying to bring in. It's right there. You see it? Everyone see that? You tell me what it is and then I can know. <laughs> it's, um, so God was challenging Israel. We're talking about drinking. And, oh, I know, and eating. And so Proverbs challenges, and it challenges the immoral, adulterous woman. And it uses the picture, it says, that she 
the, I, I, forgive me for not knowing the exact wording here, but she partakes of her sin, she commits adultery, and they liken it to she eats, she wipes her mouth, and then she says, I have done no evil. And that's exactly what Israel was doing. It's exactly what Israel was doing. They, had, they were partaking in this immoral, uh, pagan cult. They were not living for the Lord. And yet they said, I'm innocent. Not long ago, we preached through 1 John. And in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, you may remember, the Bible says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. As I think of our mission, let's bring this to today, because so many of God's people are so distracted that we rarely have time for the Lord. Uh, clearly the Lord is being put on the back burner of many a professing believer and, and all across, not just in Upper Darby, but all across America. Um, the average 85% of Bible-believing churches uh, are under 200 people and many of them are much smaller, like ours would be. Um, but uh, less and less people are making church a priority. There's a, a missionary family, missionary couple, uh, that I know that uh, have been ministering for as long as we've been ministering here. They've been ministering in Japan. And they've been faithfully serving the Lord. And in uh, our brother's prayer letter, he quotes from a, a, an author, but he makes this point. This is profound. And I want to remind you that our relationship with God today uh, entails with it and is intimately connected with our mission as a church. And, and here's what he wrote. He said, missions isn't something the church does. Rather, it is what the church is. And then he quotes a, a writer named David Bosch. And he says this, the, the writer, The New Testament does not recognize a missionless church. Mission is before church. Church exists for the sake of mission. The church did not give us the word. The living word gave us a mission and sent us out to bring him great glory. The engine and heart of the church is nothing less than gospel advancement. Where churches exist for their own sake, and not the mission's sake, they become fossilized institutions which have lost their movement ethos. Ethos is their characteristic spirit. I want to read that again. That is an awesome quote. And I hope it sinks in, because let's get before us, we have a mission and the mission has nothing to do with where America is at or how difficult or how easy ministry is. It's still our calling. Again, the living word gave us a mission and sent us out to bring him great glory. The engine and heart of the church is nothing less than gospel advancement. Where churches exist for their own sake and not the mission's sake, they become fossilized institutions which have lost their movement ethos. And I submit to you that the danger in our cushy country is that we want our church to form the same function as Walmart. You know, we want the easy self-serve. Uh, we want it when we want it. And, and folks, I don't, you know, Walmart is all about you know catering to meet our needs. The church is... It's designed, it's, it's like the difference, I love that illustration of the, the cruise ship versus the troop ship. You know, and, and I remember, I wish I had it before me, but it was, might have been one of the Queen Elizabeth's initially was created as a, I think a troop ship, which was to send soldiers to battle, and then it was refurbished to be a cruise ship, and the whole purpose changed radically. And, and, and it's a great illustration. I've used it before. But it, it's a reminder to us that the church is not a cruise ship, but we want it to be. The church is a troop ship training soldiers to go forth into battle. I remember, and no church is perfect. I understand that. But I remember the dear people I pastored in Lancaster. It was a, even smaller than what we are. Uh, but I remember, uh, you know, our, our goal was to reach that community for Jesus Christ. And I remember there was a guy that started coming to church, and his name was Earl. I'll never forget Earl. 
And Earl was a big guy, and uh, he had needs. Earl, and, and this is what the church people seem to forget. Earl needed the Lord. Earl needed Jesus Christ. Earl, to my knowledge from talking to him, was not saved. And he was coming to our church. Hmm. Take note. Earl had a distinction about him. I don't mean just, you know, Earl had a certain aroma. Can I say that? Do you get what I mean? Earl, I guess, struggled with hygiene. And um, so you could smell Earl before he got here. You know? Uh, and it was very evident. Did I tell you that Earl needed the Lord? You know what? The people communicated maybe unintentionally but they were so wrapped up in their own comfort and their own convenience that they forgot that Earl needed the Lord and they were so offended by his odor that they drove him off and I remember I was so upset about that um, here was an opportunity to reach out to a man that needed the Lord and, um, you know, he came for a while. But I remember, uh, you know, there were, just, there were people that just could not, they wouldn't even think about the fact that this man needed Jesus Christ. They were so hung up on his hygiene or lack thereof that they couldn't get past that. And I submit to you folks, we have had all kinds of people walk through our church, some smelly, some nice smelling. You know, I mean, we've had all different kinds. And we've had all different kinds of people with different backgrounds. And, and, and some of them were, you know, in personality pleasant. Some of them not so pleasant. But folks, let's never lose sight of our mission to reach people for Jesus Christ. Just like the people of Judah. I'll close with this. this um, oh, there's so much. And I'm, I'm really out of time. But I want to encourage you because I have... A, Josh's letter, his recent letter, was a blessing to me. Um, it starts out, last summer, God totally changed my life. You've got to read Josh's letter, and you've got to read those two paragraphs. They bless me uh, beyond anything. If I, I'm just going to read it. I'm gonna, I don't care if we go over time here. I'm going to read it. Just the two paragraphs that really challenge me. Last summer, God totally changed my life, Josh said. He showed me what sacrificing for the kingdom meant. Dying to self accepting hospitality, sometimes for things I really didn't want, and he really changed my heart. He brought my will to more closely align with his, that all peoples, tribes, nations, and languages would hear and believe the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, conquering death and giving the free gift of eternal abundant life to all who believe in him and him alone. What I just said... 2.5 billion people around the world have never heard. He said, I want to plead with you on behalf of those people. By the way, we are going to start accepting uh, donations on behalf of Josh to facilitate that. And, and I think we're going to have him come and challenge us or share some more. But uh, take, care of, you know, take note of his uh, letter, and then we'll let you know how you can give. But he says, I want to plead with you on behalf of those people. The world's biggest problem is not hunger, poverty, or evil politicians, it is lostness. People are lost without Christ. And unless they hear and believe the gospel, they will live an unsatisfying, empty life and die without hope. And he goes on. It's just a great letter and it challenges us. It reminds us, folks, it's all about our mission. And let's, let's be like Jesus Christ. Let's be like Jeremiah, who sees these people and and sees their rebellion, but sees their need, their souls, came across this, and I close with this. Back in the 1600s, and I love that period in England especially, uh, as I've studied it, but um, the two major universities, Oxford and Cambridge, decided to admit commoners 
as students. Up to that time, you had to, you had to know somebody to, to go to college there. And um, they started a policy where they would let the, the low life come in, the commoners. And so they listed, the students were listed on the record by name and title. And the commoners' names were listed with the Latin inscription sine or sine nobilate. Sine means um, without. Nobilate is nobility. So they'd have their name and then they'd have sine nobilate. By the way, that reminds me of the, remember the other one? Uh, During that time when uh, the potters would uh, put a sign on their products that were genuine that had no cracks, you know, sine sincere without, without cracks. That's Latin again. Well, anyway, so they put the word sine nobilita, no, nobilate or no, nobilate or S period N-O-B. And so, and eventually it was just all abbreviated. If you were a commoner, your, next to your name would be S period N-O-B. Put that together and what do you got? Snob, right? And isn't and that that phrase is used today when we you know we look we become snobs when we look down at oh commoners people that are you know they're below us folks may that not never be may you and I see people as Jesus did they were sheep without a shepherd and may we be like Jeremiah and lovingly with passion in our hearts warn them about the judgment to come. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for loving us. Thank You for those Jeremiah's that You put in our life to warn us, to give, to lovingly challenge us about judgment to come. Risking, offending us. Risking, uh, ruffling our feathers so that we would know we needed a Savior. Father, help us to love people in the same way so that we'd be willing to be the Jeremiah's and warn and plead and entreat. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand, please. Take your hymn books out, and we will close in song.